Folks, I'm glad to be here again. I love this place. Um, Bob, how many times have you been doing this, this conference? We started in 2009. Because these guys asked me up here, have I been What's here before? That? They asked me, have I been here before for this conference? Uh, <laughs> I think I've missed twice. Yeah. Does that I, sound right? We did, we did two in 09, and we've done one every year since, and I think there have been two that you were not at. Well, I love it here. I love my, my time. Uh, that thing about him reading my stuff at a PhD seminar, you know what that means. That just means I'm really, really old. Um, and he's holding up the fact that he's younger than I am. So that's, you know. A friend of mine a long time ago said, when someone gives you a lot of praise, and that was a beautiful introduction, I appreciate it. He said, but always remember something. He said, Praise is like perfume. You should sprinkle it on lightly. You're not supposed to drink it. <laughs> and so I try to keep that in mind. Hey, this is serious because it, I took, um, I've just had too many people writing about doubt anymore. I've had 650 conversations with doubters. I got smart. I taught a PhD seminar on doubt. I only teach, uh, I teach full-time at the PhD level. And um, I tell the folks in the seminar, if you take this class, I have an excuse to send you anybody I want to, and you have to be able to deal with them, because you could really help me out. There's a guy in the class, you wouldn't think he would be a volunteer for this. Um, he has a disease, a pretty nasty disease. He is a pistol instructor for the National Rifle Association. You know Liberty's a gun-carrying campus. So when we have our PhD courses, I have one guy who positions himself, we, there's no windows in the room. One guy positions himself by the front door and this guy is kitty corner over in the other corner. He's the pistol instructor. When he comes in in the morning, they always go, Ron, where's your pistol? And he goes, you see it? You don't? Then I did a good job. And they look all over and they check his pockets and it's down on his briefcase right next to us. <laughs> the other guy's an ex-Marine and he wasn't a Christian. And he was in Afghanistan and um, Iraq. And he told my wife, my wife's dad was a Green Beret, 100, 101st, 82nd Airborne fought in Germany, Korea, four tours of duty in Nam. And he told my wife, he said, I sit by the door when your husband's teaching. He said, you know why I do? He said, I have my old Marine knife in my pocket that we went on missions with. He said, if somebody comes in who's not supposed to, something will happen that knife that you don't want me to repeat, but the guy won't get more than another step, I guarantee it. Now, you wouldn't think Ron would be the guy to volunteer for this. I said, I need somebody, he's the pistol guy. I need somebody to take these people and be very pastoral with them. And he said, I'd love it. I'd love to do it. And he got it down. And over the last probably two years, I've probably sent him 20 people doubters. One time I sent him six of them in one week. And he kept saying, lay it on, lay it on. I'm laying up treasures in heaven. Now picture a veteran saying this kind of stuff. And he takes these guys and he's loving with them. And then I get letters back from the people he talks to. They'll say, I don't know who you have there, but the guy's a gem. And he's healed me. And I can serve the Lord again. And I was ready to quit last week. I, I just, I'll just start with that. I don't know even why I did that, except to say most doubt is not factual. You don't pile on the evidences because you're not going to help too many people. It's good to know the evidences. But for a lot of people, you have to deal with their emotions. You have to help them through things in their life. So I'll just start with that, let you think about that. Um, I'm hoping tonight that everything I say today and tomorrow, I'm excited a lot about these two lectures. Let me tell you why. I'm excited because the lecture tonight 
I've done it over and over and over again. So I've put some of you people through a lot of bondage. I'm curious, how many of you have heard this first lecture, the timeline? How many of you have heard it before? Okay, about 20 hands. Um, how many of you have heard it more than twice? How many of you have heard it more than five times? How many of you have heard it more than eight times? Did we catch anybody? One. One. Eight times. Okay. <clears throat> I hope, if you've heard it more than once, you're here because it's a typical history lecture. History lectures have a lot of moving parts. Now, my PhD is in history and philosophy of religion, so I could be in the history department like I am in the philosophy department. I just got stuck, you know, I just started doing philosophy early in my career. But history is totally different than philosophy. You think just as hard, but there's different reasons for setting forth evidences. <clears throat> And I hope those of you who raise your hand, and you've been here a lot of times, it's because you want to keep hearing it and getting the pieces together. Because, like Dr. Stewart just said to you, I hope it's because you're going to take it and use it. I have given this message to 11-year-olds and 14-year-olds at a Christian school. One was for a Bible class and one was for a history class. I forget which is which. But when I was done, as the teacher was coming up, I said, I said to her, do you think they understood it? Did I speak over their head? No, no, no. <clears throat> it was easy. <clears throat> I gotta warn you guys, I got a pocket full of uh, lozenges, but I am not sick. Last weekend I had the flu, viral. It's gone, it's been gone for a whole week, but the laryngitis stays. So if I take one of these out, and you'll know what that's about. <clears throat> so I hope you'll take this, and I hope you'll learn the moving parts. I hope you'll use it, because I'm prejudiced. But in my estimation, there's no refutation for this approach if you use it carefully. Um, I know the speakers are uh, tired and they've got to get their sleep, but is by any chance is Tim McGrew here tonight? He's sleeping for sure. That's okay, I'm going to be sleeping when he's speaking tomorrow. I wasn't, but now I am. <clears throat> Tim's wife, Lydia, wrote a book that you may know about on reliability, and she has a comment at the end. Now, she's been a little bit critical of minimal facts arguments, but that's fine, that's fine. But she does make a one-liner that I can't believe. I use the minimal facts argument, which I'll define for you in just a second. But she says, the minimal facts argument has almost totally taken over apologetics as the number one method that is used today, evidential method, in presenting the gospel. I hope it does that. But I hope it answers people's questions. I hope it's there, you know, for a reason. I hope it, well, let me just, let me just give you the definition. Well, let me first tell you what I'm gonna do tomorrow. These are book in lectures. This is the one where you guys raise your hands because several of you have heard it a lot. But tomorrow is a lecture I've only given three or four times. Now, <clears throat> when I define the minimal facts argument, it goes like this. The minimal facts argument, which I, developed during my dissertation at Michigan State. My thesis is you can take the facts which the critics allow and using only those facts, there's enough of a basis to say that the resurrection of Jesus is by far the best explanation for the data we have. The first most important moving part is I will use no fact that is not multiply evidenced by a bunch of other evidences. You stick a fact out there and all these facts come rushing in to say, hey, that's true because. And it's because the facts 
let's just say the little facts back up the big one, the main one. Critical scholars don't argue about these facts. If somebody would say to me, and they do sometimes, what percent of scholars do you think would agree with this data? And I say it's going to be the 90-something percentile. When do you have 90-something percentile of scholars agree with any fact? Now, I'll use this for an example. A new book just came out. Whiffen Stock is the publisher. It's by Graham Twaltree, a New Testament scholar from the London School of Theology. And it's on the nature miracles of Jesus. Now, you may know that the fact that Jesus is a miracle worker is conceded by, well, some writers say conceded by 100% of scholars today. I think it's a little, that's a little high because there's some people in this book who don't believe it. But it's very well attested that Jesus is a miracle worker. And here's how you define miracles. The critical community defines miracles as healing, exorcisms, and nature miracles. Healing, exorcism, nature miracles. But this book is on the nature miracles because they're the toughest ones to evidence. Think of it this way. Dom Crossan, who's been in this room before for the very first Greer Heard lecture series, said in one of his books, the most important natural miracle of all is the resurrection of Jesus. So keep that in mind. But it's the hardest one to evidence. <clears throat> and some people reject that Jesus did miracle work. You know, it's one thing to tell a man you're healed. It's something else to tell the waves to calm down right now, because I said so. And in this book is a, a author named James Crossley. He is now the editor of the Journal for the Study of the Historical Jesus. James is an agnostic. He's very skeptical. When he writes this chapter in the book, he says the nature miracles of Jesus are baloney. It didn't happen. They're legend. Give up on it. He and I dialogued a couple years ago. And as skeptical as he is, we had a two-hour dialogue. And the talk show host, this was on Unbelievable, we were live in the studio, both of us. And the topic was, do the minimal facts support the resurrection of Jesus? And Justin Briley said, Gary, what minimal facts are you going to use tonight? And I said, I'm going to use six. I said, good. Why did he ask me? Because the numbers I use go anywhere from three to seven. I change the numbers. Why? Because nobody only grants me that few. Most people grant you 12, 15, there's way more than this. So I think it's kind of fun to play the skeptic and say, you're way too conservative. Remember that old program used to be on television? I could name that song in four notes. And somebody else would come and say, I could name that song in three notes. And so they play three notes, and if you could name it, fine, you win the point. If not, the other guy gets it. Well, that's kind of how I feel like I'm doing. I'm talking down the number of facts. And so I said, I'm going to use six. And when I defined the six, Justin Bradley turned to James Crossley and said, James, do you have a problem with any of these six? And James said, I do not. I'll concede all of them. And Justin said, okay, well, let's get going. And James said, can I say one more thing? And Justin said, sure. He said, these six facts may be the six strongest facts in the entire New Testament. That's why nobody messes around with them. See, and over the years, I've been doing this for a long time, nobody ever says to me, I don't think you can prove that fact. What kind of data do you have for that one? So tomorrow morning, I decided to do a lecture, not because anybody asked me, I mean, nobody asked me this question. But I want to know, what are the backup for the six main minimal facts? And tomorrow I have about 65 facts to give you, an average of about 11 facts per minimal fact. 11 facts on average that say this is a minimal fact because. What's the backup for it? 
and you'll have to come with a, I know it'll be early in the morning. Um, very few people in this room probably stay up later than I do, so it's going to be, it'll be touch and go if I'll be here tomorrow. <laughs> but Dr. Stewart will just have to give the lecture, so. Um, but that's the other side of it, and I don't do that. Why don't I do it? Because nobody asks for it. Everybody just, like James Crossley, goes, yeah, I'll give them to you. But if you ask for the backup, what would the backup look like? And that's tomorrow, tomorrow morning. All right. Okay, the whole lecture, I, do, I have a PowerPoint, but I never use it, because it's hard for me to stop and keep pushing the things. I'm going to use this, if you've seen this before, I'm going to use the whole floor up here, and I'm going to walk off a timeline. For the most part, it's only going to be 25 years in duration. And it's the answer to the question, what do our early data look like when it comes to the crucifixion, death, burial, resurrection, and appearances <clears throat> of Jesus? I'm going to start by going down here, and I'm simply going to call this ground zero. Why? I had a guy write me just a couple days ago. He said, please tell me what year Jesus died. He said, if you can't tell me that year, I'm really going to be bothered. <laughs> you don't normally make judgments about people like this, especially when you don't know them. And I, but I said to myself, boy, and if I can't give him these reasons, I'll prove this guy's obsessive or compulsive. He said, I think it's 32. <laughs> I wrote back to him, I said, nobody says it's 32, except you. Nobody else. 30 or 33. Because you've got to get the moon right, because of the Passover. But, so I call it ground zero, only because people don't debate this. It's just not important to them. 30 or 33, and we go pro and con. Creation down there. 2018, down there. And if somebody asks you, how do you know events 30, 30 years later, how do you know these things happened? What kind of backup would you give? Now, here's an answer you don't want to give if you're doing apologetics. Well, the Bible says, and they're going to go, <laughs> yeah, right. Well, the Quran says, the Bhagavad Gita says, and what are you going to say? So if you're not careful, it becomes a shouting contest, and it's like, you're going to be going to hell. No, you're going to hell. I mean, how, how far can this conversation go? And basically what it means is I don't know any more reasons. So, but here's what's good about the minimal facts. I hope I'm not bothering anybody to say this. I'm going to ask you this before this lecture. All the times I've been here. But if somebody said to me, if you have to use the reliability of Scripture to make this argument, I'd stop and I'd go, I don't. All right, what else? Well, what if there's an error in the Bible? Like, how was Judas, how did Judas die? If I'm in a university, I go like this. I go, and? Why are you saying that? Well, I want to know where you're coming from. And? Well, I'm bothered that it seems like there's two issues, and, there, and he's, it seems like he's either went out and hanged himself or he fell and blew himself up. And, and? Well, would it bother you if there's an error in Scripture? And? Why are you doing this? To make a point. Now, you got to remember where I teach, Liberty University. Inerrancy is very important to me. But I want to say something right up here in front that I hope you get, because it's a theme of my whole two tonight and tomorrow. If all we know is that Jesus died on the cross for our sins, is the Son of God, because he made those claims, at least he made claims. He may claim to be the Son of God. He died on the cross for our sins. He was raised from the dead. If all you know is that that message is true, 
Christianity follows. But what if I can't figure out the year Jesus was born? Christianity follows. What if I don't know how Judas died? Christianity follows. What about the, the genocide verses in the Old Testament? Christianity follows. I'm not saying those things are not important. I teach apologetics. I hope I or somebody in my department is really good on those other questions. And I'll call so-and-so to answer the questions about genocide, and I'll call somebody else to answer this question. Let's pass it around. We need to answer these questions. But if Jesus is the Son of God who died on the cross for your sins, who was raised from the dead, Christianity is true. There's a sense in which I can take a postgraduate class with Paul, and I'll get the rest of the questions straightened out. And you go, ha-ha, yeah, that's cute. But it really is the answer. Nobody called us to answer every question there is in the world. We start with the gospel and work out. The rest of the, these doctrines and the scripture itself, these are very, very important, very important. But they're not the first thing we have to solve, in my opinion. Okay. So how do we evidence this? The average Christian is going to say something like this. Have you read the Gospel of Mark? Yeah. Mark's pretty early, wouldn't you say? Yeah. 35, 40, maximum 45 years after the cross? Pretty good. Now I'm going to use critical dating, the critics, to show you that it doesn't change anything. New Testament critics, Bart Ehrman, is going to put Matthew at about 80, Luke at about 85, and everybody puts John at about 95, or how long after the cross? 95 subtract 30 is... 65 years. Is that too long in ancient history? If you think it is, you're not, you don't do ancient history. Let me give you some stats. Have you ever heard these before? Some people say that Jews copied their view of resurrection of the body from Zoroastrians when they spent time in the Babylonian captivity. That'd be a good, a good chance that they copied from them then. I mean, if those teachings were around, they could have picked it up. When did these teachings get published? When were Zoroaster's writings published? Zoroaster lives approximately 6th century B.C. You know what the earliest book is? About 1,000 to 1,500 years later. How, an epistemic question. How do you know the Jews copied the resurrection of the body from the Zoroastrians when the Jewish teachings that teach the resurrection of the body predate the Zoroastrian writings? Who copied off whom? Oh, hadn't thought about that. All right, let's think of another one. The Upanishads are sometimes compared to the Gospels, not because they're history books, because one author says there's not a single historical reason for believing the Upanishads, a, a Hindu writer. But they're often compared to the Gospels because of their importance. You know the earliest Upanishad we have? You know how long it was written after, the, after we have it, how, after the original writing? Now remember, the worst the Gospels get is plus 65, Upanishads. 1,800 years later, Here's my favorite. If you think Krishna lived, maybe the best known Hindu character, I've got a Hindu source that says most Hindu scholars think the man never lived. Now, someone's going to say, oh, a lot of people believe that about Jesus, too. Not scholars. But most Hindu scholars think he never lived. But even if he did, do you know how old the oldest copy is of the Bhagavad Gita, which gives the exploits of 
Krishna, plus 4,200 years. How does 35 or 40 sound with Mark? Pretty good. Bob, have you guys, have you guys sat around here? Have you guys heard that the date, Tawa, up at your place? Have you heard that the Mark fragment has been dated? I was told I can tell the date by the people who are involved with it. You know the Mark fragment. A fragment of the Gospel of Mark has been found. It's the earliest fragment we have. It predates Ryland's fragment of John. Ryland's little tiny piece of John is about plus 25 after the book of John. Mark, this little tiny fragment of Mark, looked like it was a first century um, artifact. But the date has come in recently that this fragment of Mark dates between 80 and 110 AD. Ryland's is 125. This is officially the oldest fragment we have from the New Testament. And critics have already said, if Mark is here at plus 65 or 70, and we have a, frac a fragment that may be 80, 85, the Mark is probably back about 40, maybe 50. Jesus is 30, plus 10 to 20. And I was told by another fella that more fragments, New Testament fragments, have been found and it hasn't hit the public yet. There's some more in the pipeline. 80 to 110. And the aforementioned James Crossley, the editor of the Journal for the Study of Circle of Jesus, James did his doctoral dissertation. He's an agnostic. He did his doctoral dissertation on dating the Gospel of Mark for historical reasons. You know what he dates it? 38 to 42 AD. His mentor, who passed away in 2014, Morris Casey, also dates at about 40 AD, is also an agnostic non-Christian who says he, lost the, he left the Christian faith in 1962. You go, well, that's where he got it then. He got it from his teacher. No. Morris Casey holds that Mark is 40 AD, but for totally different reasons than James does. They have two sets of historical reasons, and they both put Mark at about here on our timeline. Now, not everything's roses, but we live in a good, this is a good time to be alive. You young people who are here, I wished I could live my life over again. With, <laughs> here's the only catch. I don't want to relearn anything, Tawa. I have to have the information I have now and start from here, and I don't want to do my PhD again. It about killed me. All right, if I can have a PhD and know everything I know now, I'd love to be 30 again and start over again. You young people here are growing up in a very exciting time to be alive. And the data are all over the place. And when people reject Christianity, this is gonna be a question I'll get right away, so I'll answer it right off the bat. Then why don't these skeptics believe? You assume belief is about the facts. It's mostly not. It's mostly about how do you feel. It's mostly about which way is the wind blowing. It's mostly about how you're going to live your life if there's a God and you have to answer to him. I heard a lecture a few weeks ago, a serious lecture, that the biggest fight in the world today, the biggest reason people don't come to God, if you're in the 18 to 35 age group, Here's the biggest decision you have to make. If you're single in the 18 to 35 category, here's your question. God or sex? And the speaker, you'd all know the name, that's the thesis he developed with surveys and data. 
people want to be free, so they often leave it for about 15, 20 years. And then uh, I just read today, about half of our young people who walk away from the Lord, only about half come back. How sad is that? It's not the data. I'll come back to this at the end. Okay. So, I was debating a fellow a few years ago in this room, Bob, when I was debating um, on the question of the afterlife for the Greer Heard Lecture Series with uh, Michael Shermer on Is There an Afterlife? And one of the fellows he chose, he was a physicist, and he stood up here and he got to speak up on that platform right there. And he said, 35 to 65 years after the cross is way too long to do ancient history. I told you about the guy with the gun. I told you about the guy with the knife. I was the ice hockey coach at Liberty University for nine years. First game I coached, the game was over, whistle blew, and a bench-clearing brawl started. I'm, this is a true story. I turned to tell my guys not to leave the bench, and I realized I was the only guy on the bench. <laughs> the guys fought on the ice. Forty people fought on the ice for 20 minutes. The refer one of the referees got beat up, <laughs> and we never had a problem with attendance after that. I used the phrase, going hockey on somebody. Now, Ta was from Edmonton. By the way, I met a guy in the airport today from Edmonton. We had a good little talk, asked him what was wrong with this team. But anyway. Um, and I felt like going hockey on this guy. You're gonna sit there and tell me 35 to 65 years is too late to do history? Learn history. Don't talk off the top of your head about something you obviously know nothing about. And so it was my turn to get up there, and we had two lecterns right next to each other. I said to him, do you think we know a lot about Alexander the Great? He said, we do. Do you remember this? Do you think we know a lot about Alexander the Great? And he said, we do. I said, really? A lot, right? Philip of Macedon's his father? Some people say it was the most brilliant matchup in history about two geniuses in different fields when Alexander, a genius, probably the best, probably the sharpest genius ever in the world up until that time and maybe up until Julius Caesar, um, who was his personal tutor? Someone tell me. Who was Alexander's personal tutor? Aristotle. Come on, honey, you got to get out of bed. Aristotle will be here in a minute. <laughs> we know all this stuff about him. How he did the phalanx and how he worked across the field and how the Persians couldn't stand up to him because of his new way of fighting. We knew a lot about Alexander. And I said to him, do you know when the earliest source is? He said, no, I don't. I said, we should before you start making comments about the Gospels. If this is Alexander's death, about 325 years before Jesus, here's the earliest major source. I don't mean an inscription, I don't mean four words in a rock. I mean an earliest major source for Alexander. On my timeline, here's the earliest historical source for Alexander. I haven't measured this out, but I'm trying to get it right here. You guys get the point? Earliest source for Alexander. The Gospels are horrible at plus 35 to plus 65. Alexander, earliest source, just short of 300 years. And here's the comeback. Well, that doesn't mean anything. Alexander has history. You have propaganda. Really? Yeah. 
history, uh, Alexander as history sources. Well, first of all, let me just tell you something about Alexander. Alexander. Earliest sources, plus 280. But the two best known sources, Arian and Plutarch, plus four and a quarter to 450. Someone do some quick math. One of you brains here. How many times does 65 go into 450? Come on, Ray. How many? Seven and a half times. Alexander is seven and a half times later than John on Jesus. And here's the comeback, once again. But Alexander is history. You guys only have religion. Really? Really? Why well, should have thought of that when I picked up Plutarch? And here's how Plutarch opens this non-religious, historical-only book. It's commonly believed that Alexander's mother was a virgin and he was the son of a god. Nothing like a little theology on the side in good old Greece. <laughs> but Alexander is permissible because we like him. Jesus is not. Just look at politics in our country today because we don't like it. I love C.S. Lewis. When people are starting to have doubts, says Lewis, most people start having doubts, and he picks on men. Most people start having doubts because they find a way to make some money that's not entirely legal, or they see a woman in her office who's too good looking for her own good. These are his examples. But they'll never say to you, I'm not a Christian right now because I've been sinning. Have you ever heard anybody say that? I've been sinning. Lewis says they will convert it every time to this. I've been thinking. You have not. You've been sinning. Try that with them next time. <laughs> That's why the years of 18 to 35 are so important. I've been thinking, shut up. There's other things that become more important to them in Christianity for a few years. Seriously. So you compare Alexander to Jesus, and there's no takers on data. And you can't get away from it by saying Alexander's a history book. It's not a theology book. History and theology are not airtight categories in the ancient world like they are today. All right. Now, I'm actually giving you two arguments tonight for that back there. I just did the beginnings of a reliability argument. Lydia McGrew is correct. She said the problem with the minimal facts argument is it does it what it does it does really really well but it does just a little bit we need wholesale backup i agree with her in fact look at mike lacona who a student of mine at liberty he did a 750 page dissertation on minimal facts argument what's he doing today his second possibly he hasn't gotten the word yet his second possibly oxford book on reliability he's going to the general reliability now for the gospels when you have two arrows in your quiver, a general liability argument and a minimal facts argument, I want to know who's going up against you. Actually, I want to know who's going up against you with the minimal facts argument alone. In a recent book review, Angus Manoj says, the minimal facts argument takes an increasing number of boulders away from the atheist and behind which they can no longer hide so that they have fewer and fewer places to retreat. But it's not just a minimal facts argument, that's happening in a lot of fields. And people are not being, people are not comfortable having less data instead of more data. Again, that's the topic I wanna to come back to at the end. All right, from this point on, I'm gonna do the minimal facts argument. I think reliability is good. What would reliability do? How many years are in between? Who are the authors? Can we back, get back any earlier? How about a fragment of Mark? How about an early fragment of John? Why do James Crossley and Mo um, 
Maurice, K uh, Maurice Casey put Mark back at 40 AD. How early are our sources? How good are they? Those are reliability arguments. But now I'm going to use a minimal facts argument, and I'm not knowingly going to use anything from this point on that's not conceded by everyone. Instead of using the Gospels, I'm going to argue the way the critics do. I'm going to use Paul and Paul alone. Paul is the critics' darling. They love Paul. Why? Well, I think wrongly, but they think he's the only critic that we know which New Testament books are written by him. Bart Ehrman says this all the time. He's the only one we know who wrote certain books. Many critics say the Gospels are anonymous. We can have that debate. That's what they say. They want to know who our authors are, how early, how do they know the data, how can we be sure what they report is correct? Great questions. And they're the ones I'm going to do for the rest of this time. Now, there are 13 books in the New Testament that bear Paul's name. The critics are going to grant you seven of them. You know what's amazing? They always give you the same seven. You'll look a long way before you'll see somebody who will subtract one of the seven but give you another one in its place. They all cite the same seven. And if you're a pastor and you're doing messages, you'll almost always take your messages from one of these seven epistles. They're the major epistles that we have. Here's the seven they grant. Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1st Thessalonians, and the little one chapter book, Philemon. Okay, once again, Romans, 1st and 2nd Corinthians, Galatians, Philippians, 1 Thessalonians, Philemon. What do they do when they grant you those books? Here's what they think. They think Paul is authoritative. Inspired? No, they'd never say that. That's not the way they think. But authoritative. What's authoritative mean? Man, this guy studied under the right people. According to Acts, he studied under Gamaliel. That would be like Ray or Tawa. Who do you want to pick? That would be like getting your PhD today under Al Planiga. What do you think? Pretty good. That would be Gamaliel at that time. Paul's a scholar. Second, he's honest. How do you know he's honest? Look how his life changed. Look how he stood up to enemies and took beatings his entire life. Remember the list he gave? 40 lashes minus one three times. Shipwrecked, stoned, and left for dead. Many other times. That means he's sincere. What does that mean? That means he would not knowingly tell you a lie, most likely. He's a scholar. He's honest. He might be wrong, but he won't mislead you. Studying of the right people, and this might be the most important one. He knew the right people. More about that in just a second. So Paul is in the right place at the right time to get the right data to complete our argument. When does Paul start writing? Well, we have ground zero back there about 30 AD, and Paul's writing. First Corinthians is put unanimously at about 55 AD. It's plus 25. Now, I could do this. I could stop the lecture and go, all right, that's it. That's the lecture for tonight. Any questions? We got it back to 25 years. You happy? Beats the Gospels. Yep, we're ready to go. Let's see how much better we can do. Paul's writing in about 55. Paul came to Corinth 51 to 52 AD. You go, how do you know? What if I told you that some New Testament scholars say this date is more readily ascertainable than any other New Testament date when he came to Corinth. You go, how would you know that? Because Greek city leaders, we call them mayors today, these guys only had one-year terms. 
And we're told in the New Testament who the city mayor is when Paul comes to town. How convenient. And a stone inscription on a pavement has been found telling us that this guy was the mayor from 51 to 52 AD. So, he writes at 55. He was there 51 to 52, so we're getting there by increments. We're 21 to 22 years away. But look how 1 Corinthians 15, 3, maybe the most commented on set of verses in the New Testament. Paul says, I gave you what I was given. I gave you what I was given. Those are powerful words. You go, yeah, okay, I'm a grad student. I got it the first time. You don't really have to spend a lot of time here. No, listen. I gave you what I was given. In the New Testament, there are dozens of little creedal passages. They are the answer to this question of what did the earliest apostolic preaching consist before we had a single New Testament book. And the critical community is unanimous. It's like the books, the seven books of Paul. They agree where these are, about when they're dated. And Bart Ehrman, the skeptic, Bart Ehrman, says a number of these are pre-Pauline. You know what pre-Pauline means? Bart defines it. Here's pre-Pauline. Jesus died. When did Paul come to the Lord? About two to three years after the cross. Okay? Jesus dies. Paul comes to the Lord. Pre-Pauline means when Paul embraced the Lord, these sayings were already in existence. Say again. Are you saying these, these statements date from 31, 32, 33 AD? I am. Do the critics concede this? They do. Wow. 25 is great. Paul was there three to four years earlier. Good. Now, I gave you that which I also received. When and from whom did Paul get this material? The consensus New Testament position is that Paul got this material when he visited Jerusalem at plus five or plus six after the cross. Plus five or plus six. Go, cool. please, if you don't mind, how do you get that? Let's do the math. 30-ish A.D., Jesus dies. When does Paul come to the Lord? Plus two. Maybe plus three. He says, three years later, I went up to Jerusalem. Okay, you all with me? For those who believe Paul came to the Lord at plus two, plus three is five. Oh, no, I think it was plus three. Good. Plus three plus plus three is plus six. If that's ground zero at plus 35, 36, Paul is in Jerusalem. He spends 14, 15 days with Peter and James, the brother of Jesus. What they discuss? Well, we're not told in Galatians 1. We are told what the topic is in Galatians 2 because he goes back a second time. But I could ask you this way. What's, a, what's the book of Galatians about? Here's the book of Galatians. I say it in a sentence. It's all about the gospel. Don't add to it, or it's anathema. Don't subtract from it, or it's anathema. Get it right, preach it, don't do anything different. I'll check back with you in a few years. Bingo, that's Galatians. What the gospel is, get it right. Paul wants you to get the gospel right. By the way, whenever the gospel is defined in the New Testament, um, God's side of things, what do we have to believe? These three are always present. Deity of Jesus, death, resurrection. Deity, death, resurrection. Now, other times, other things are thrown in. For example, once this is born of a woman. That could be that in that passage, Romans 1, there's a contrast between being the son of God and born of a woman. And we call that two natures, and it sounds a little bit like Philippians 2, which, by the way, is an early creed. But we get this material 
That's pre-Pauline. See, here's just an aside how powerful this is. How do you know Paul did not, wasn't the true founder of Christianity? This objection is over 100 years old. It comes from a school of thought called Religiengeschichte in Germany. I bet you didn't know that. I bet you couldn't guess. <laughs> History of religions. We copied off other religions. Really? Yeah, they taught we copied off other religions. So who was the inventor of Christianity? Paul. Who was Jesus? A nice, kind, turn the other cheek Jewish peasant. Who's Paul? The perverter, the heretic. He founded Christianity. Really? Yeah. So when did Paul start this? I don't know. Plus six, plus seven, plus eight. He's preaching here. If Paul made up Christianity here, why, from the early creeds alone, do we have a very high Christology from before Paul was saved? How did Paul make it up if Paul wanted to wipe out the movement? Here's another one for you. Richard Bauckham says this, but he didn't invent this. He got it from somebody else. But this is pretty cool. I love this one. I love one-liners that change lives. Here's Bauckham's theological one-liner. The earliest Christology was the highest Christology. That turns contemporary theology on its head. In the old days, if you studied Rudolf Altman, who was boss when I went to grad school, they thought that it took almost 170 years till John to get the high Christology. Really? Oh, yeah, it took like 95 A.D. to unpack it. Really? No, consider this. The earliest Christology is the highest Christology. Because out of the gate, they called Jesus Yahweh. How do you know? Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, believe in your heart that God is raised from the dead, you'll be saved. If you confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, three verses later, Paul says, quoting Joel, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And there, in the Hebrew, Lord is Jehovah. They were saying that about Paul, sorry, they were saying that about Jesus in the very beginning. And when does Romans 10, 9, and 10 date? It's a pre-Pauline creed. Right in here. Rudolf Boltman conceded that. Folks, we don't have any critics around that are as critical as Rudolf Boltman was. He was way to the left of Bart Ehrman, if you read his material. And Bart Ehrman calls it a baptismal creed from the very beginning. 1 Corinthians 11, the baptismal formula, Jesus is called Lord. And Joachim Jeremias, a Jewish, uh, 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 German New Testament scholar, said, it may be the earliest Christology of all. And it goes back to Jesus himself, says Jeremias. Say what? It goes back in here. Here's a third passage, Romans 1, 3, and 4. Jesus is called Son of God, Lord, and Messiah. When? Pre-Pauline. So when Paul's on the scene, you have Romans 1, Romans 10. Don't forget Philippians 2. What do you do with all these passages? The earliest Christology is the highest Christology. And what hoisted this early Christology out into the world? The resurrection of Jesus. Even Rudolf Boltmann will tell you that. He didn't believe in the resurrection. But he would say it was the message of the resurrection. They believed it. And that's what sent it out into the world. All right, let's go back to the timeline. So Paul comes here, plus five, plus six. He interviews Paul. He interviews Peter and James. How would you like to have been a fly on the wall? Paul could have made a nice pastoral application here, fellas just the three of us in this room. I just want you guys to know, Tom, uh, Paul could have been the first guy to give this famous sermon title its name. 
Our God is the God of the second chance. How do you know? Well, James, as I hear this story, you didn't believe. You grew up with the man. You didn't believe. I, I'm not rubbing it in. I'm just, I'm just saying. <laughs> Peter, you said you'd take your sword and strike down anybody. you die with Jesus. And you first denied him three times, and then you fled. I, I'm not criticizing. And I stood by while men, women and children died. Are you here because you heard I took your fa family's name in vain? Oh, you'll have to ask somebody about that later. I won't start that now. <clears throat> um, guys, we're all here. We all have issues. God reached down to all of us, and he changed our lives. That's a neat message. Fourteen years later, Paul said, I went back up again. Fourteen years later, scholars put this at about 48 A.D., so it's only plus 18. Hey, divide that one out easily enough. This is plus 18, but the Upanishads are 1,800 years later. So multiply that one. About 48 A.D., they go back, and... Paul specifically says in Galatians 1, 2, I think it's one of the coolest verses of the Bible. I set before the gospel, I set the gospel before them, the gospel that I was preaching, to see if I was running or had run in vain. And you go, what? Yeah, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. I don't want one of us to be teaching heresy. I set before them the gospel I was preaching to see that I had not been running in vain all these years. And someone could say, Paul, is that how you do your research? You went, you went 18 years to check it out? I think Paul would have got his back up a little bit, and he'd say, you don't listen to arguments real well, do you? I don't know what you did in grad school. He said, look at my argument. I learned it from Jesus, okay? I heard it from Jesus himself. He was my tutor. Second, three years later, I heard it from James and Peter. Do you know any better sources? All right, then. I went up to Jerusalem 18 years later. You know, you just don't get on the train and go to Jerusalem on the overnighter like you do from London to Edinburgh. It's dangerous, too. But I went back to make sure we were preaching the same message. This is at least the third time. Folks, this is called research. He got it from Jesus. He got it from the big two. He went back. 14 years later, and this time, John is there. John was the one that people probably only talked behind his back because he was goody two-shoes. John never got in trouble. Peter got in trouble, James got in trouble, Paul got in trouble, John never got in trouble. But these four, these four are by far the most influential Christians in the early church easily. And the biggest thing Paul bequeaths to us is he knew the big guys. He knew them firsthand. And they gave him their testimony, Galatians chapter 2. Well, well, Paul, don't hold us in suspense anymore. What did they say when you set the gospel before them? I think it's three verses later, five words in English. They added nothing to me. How beautiful. They added nothing to me. That means we were on the same page. And then, verse 9, they laid hands on Paul and Barnabas and gave them the right hand of fellowship. Do you ever lay, lay hands on somebody, like maybe in ordination service or something, or send someone to the mission field? Do you send heretics to the mission field or just believers? I know you're JW, but we want, we want you to be a JW from our church. pretty careful about who you send out, right? They laid hands on Paul and Barnabas because their gospels were the same. That's them saying Paul and Barnabas were right on. Here's Paul saying it the other way around. 1 Corinthians 15 verse 11. Whether it is I or them, 
He's talking about the appearances and the other apostles in context. Whether it is I or them, so we preach and so you believe. Wow. I don't care if you talk to me. Talk to Peter. Talk to John. Talk to James. They were all there. They're on the same page. How do you know we're on the same page? They blessed us and gave us the right hand of fellowship. Okay, pretty cool. We're all preaching the deity, death, resurrection of Jesus. So this sounds pretty liberty-ish. <laughs> the or, or N-O-B-T-S-ish. Do the critics agree with this on this? Well, let me give you some examples. The Jesus Seminar, not conservative. They reject, depending on how you count, up to 90% of the red-letter words of Jesus. They tell us there are multiple sources. So does John, so does, uh, John Dominic Crossan, by the way. John Dominic Crossan gives us three independent sources for the burial story, which he doesn't believe. But they have multiple sources for group appearances of Jesus. And your source could be footnote, Jesus Seminar, John Dominic Crossan, and the words not conservative. Liberal warning, liberal warning, liberal warning. And they say this is good stuff. How early? Well, it's a consensus view that this material dates plus five or plus six. Bart Ehrman says several of these sources are pre-Pauline, and they are one to two years after the cross, right there. He says we have several sources from one to two years. Bart Ehrman says that? Betcha. And when I cite a footnote from his book, Did Jesus Exist? I'll bet you it's aligned with 15 page numbers in it. How many times do you think he says it? Over and over and over and over. John, D I mean, um, James D.G. Dunn, as influential as anybody today, says the early creed in 1 Corinthians 15 was probably formulated within months of the event. When was the event? In the spring. So it could have been around by the end of the year, months? Yep. Yep, likely. Larry Hurtado, days. The message started being preached days afterwards. Consensus view. Five years max. And many critical scholars say one to two years. Uh, Gert Ludemann, atheist New Testament, German New Testament scholar, three years max from the cross. Folks, this is a great message. Let me bring this to a close. By the way, Dr. Stewart said I keep going till 11 o'clock. <laughs> but uh, he said start for one hour after I got up here, and I'm right about at the end right now. Um, we're supposed to have some questions. So he said, I don't even have to introduce him. He said, you guys all know how to do the questions. So you'd be thinking about that. Let me just say, as I'm closing, what do we do with all these, these facts? You go, well, how do you get to resurrection? I asked my PhD students. It's a real easy question, but we don't think of it this way. How do you get from minimal facts that Jesus is raised from the dead? How do you get from minimal facts that Jesus is raised from the dead? Argument goes like this. These facts are conceded by everybody because the backup's so strong. Stay tuned tomorrow for 60-something facts of backup for the six minimal facts. The backup is there. Now, if you want, I used to do this with people in class that I asked for a skeptic in my class. Who wants to be the skeptic? I will. Fine. Make up a naturalistic theory. Do we do this at Tyndale? We did. Pick a naturalistic theory. And the rest of the class goes after this. Now, sometimes two or three guys go, I want to be on his side. I want to be the skeptic. Go for it. And the rest of the class go off on this guy. All they can use are the data that everybody allows. Do you have enough to disprove the major naturalistic theories? Plenty. That's why today, Bart Ehrman, in his, well, it's not his latest book, but in one of his latest books, he now says, 
I will no longer pick a naturalistic theory. You know what I think is going on? I think he's tired of Christian's argument in the corner and him not having a lot of way to get out. So I won't pick naturalistic theories anymore. And then he says this, which to me, you got to think of who he is and see how amazing this is. He says, history alone cannot prove that Jesus is raised from the dead. But history cannot disprove the event either. If you were a skeptic, how'd you, could you say that and be comfortable? I'm not saying, I disagree with you guys that you can prove it. But I don't think I can prove my view either. Really? You're going to concede that? Because the data are really much better than what he's saying. But he says, or now on, he says, I'm not picking a naturalistic theory. As a guy told me in a debate one time, no, I'm not picking a naturalistic theory. He actually said this in a debate. You know, it was cool. I was debating in college. And over all the doors, there was a sign, no smoking, no smoking, no smoking. He smoked a pipe the entire debate. <laughs> you know how it was in the 60s. And um, I said, why don't you pick a theory? He literally said, no, I'm not going to pick a theory. He was an atheist. No, I'm not going to pick a theory. Why not? He literally said, because if I pick a theory, you'll get me in the corner and I won't like that. <laughs> so wait a minute. You're a naturalist, right? Yep. I'm not. If your theory gets you in a corner, what does that say about your theory? You know what he said to me? You know people talk with a pipe in their mouth? It went like this. Here's what he said to me. Habermas, as far as I'm concerned, this debate is over. I will not say anything else. And he didn't. <laughs> the debate was over. He quit talking. Because he said he didn't want to be roped in the corner. So that, that's what you do. Facts exist. A naturalistic theory does not make headway, as virtually everybody agrees. I can line up quotes from skeptics who say they don't do it. And I didn't say you proved the resurrection. I said the best solution is the resurrection. Now, Ray can tell you way more about this next topic than I can up here. But you know, if you study logic and you have three independent, oh, wait a minute, I forgot this guy's in the room. All right, you guys are going to have to fight it out. <laughs> Come on up. Um, if you have three arguments that independently can prove a thesis in question, and each argument is at least 80% likely. In either three, you win. You only need one of them to be true. All three is at least at 80%. What's the likelihood if they, you know, that's a C on my exam. 80 is not super. But if you have three arguments at 80, 80, and 80, what's the likelihood that you're going to get at least one of them obtaining? You should have been ready. Do you, do you really want to stipulate all the independent No, just tell me. Just, uh, Ray, do you want to do better than that? Do you want to? Uh, I see I'm nervous to say it with Tim in the room, but I think if they're fully independent, you're looking at something like uh, six and three hundred that they're all wrong. So what's that for a percentage? I'll give you one more chance. What's six and three hundred? Is that what you said? Six? Six over 300. Your, your 98. You know what the figure is? I think it's like 97.8% that Christianity is true. And that's only with three arguments, only at 80. And you need one of them to be true. Now, you've got to play the game. You've got to say, well, I don't think like that. Okay, but just... If you're willing to sit around and just say, I've got three arguments, they're all at least 80. If you have two at 90, I think it goes up to like 99. If you have two at 90, two at 90 is better than three at 80. Does that make sense? Two at 90 is better than three at 80. You go, well, who's going to tell you that? Just get together with your buddies and ask. Here's the 10 best arguments for Christianity. I did this with a bunch of guys at ETS one year. 
These guys are major ETS guys. They did it with Wynn Cordwin, David Clark, Norm Geisler. We all sat around after dinner, and I said, okay, I got some arguments for you here. What's a Kalam cosmological argument? What's this one? They go, I don't think like this. No, just play the game with me. What's this one? What's this one? What's this one? What's near-death experiences? What's resurrection of Jesus? And they all gave me these you need two 90s or three 80s in Christianity is for all intent and purposes true. Let me bring it to a close like this. I just finished a book. It's on my website. It's free for anybody who wants it. It's two e-books that are free. One is evidence for these early creeds and how we get this. And the other one is uniqueness of Jesus vis-a-vis -vis the founders of the world religions. I know I've been doing this for a long time. Remember, I wished I were 25 or 30 again. I just have to know everything I know now. I'm not going to learn it again. I refuse. I'm too old. Oh, I forgot. I'd only be 25. Um, here's what I learned doing that little book. I should have known this a long time ago. No other religion does positive apologetics. Not that we would count as good enough to be positive apologetics. On our standard of how many arguments do you have from 80% and higher. You should have seen what those 10 guys around the table came up with, how many they gave that were 75% and higher. Arguments for God's existence, afterlife, reliability, New Testament, resurrection. Do you know that no other religion? I could be wrong. If I'm wrong, please come up and correct me. I don't want to keep saying this. this it, religion is not exactly my area. But everybody has negative apologetics. Everyone does this. You're a loser. You stink. You gave a lousy argument, which just means I can't answer it. I'm really angry right now. Um, you're, that's wrong. Christians are wrong because Christians, Christians cheat all the time and they lie. I call that the Christians can be jerks argument. That's called sin. Um, <clears throat> everybody has negative apologetics. How many people do you know that have five or more positive arguments? I'm dead serious. We have a quiver full. I got counting. We have at least a dozen. Now, some of them are for religion in general. They're not only for Christianity. But the last time I gave a PowerPoint on this, I had four for religion in general, six for Christianity in particular. Things from, coming from left field that you're not going to expect as reasons. But they're extremely powerful reasons. And what about the one I started out telling you about? They've dated the fragment of Mark now, the early Mark fragment. We're getting these things all the time. Nobody can hang in there with us. That's no excuse to be cocky, but it is an excuse to witness, and it is an excuse to be secure. It is an excuse to be sure of what you believe. Although, just realize, the doubts are going to come from your emotions almost always. 70 to 80 percent of doubts come from emotions and life questions not from factual questions, especially those who know where and what the arrows are. That's not where the doubts come from. We have the best, I'll put that up against anybody. We have the best arguments there are. But the question is, are you keeping your thought life in order? Proverbs 4 says, guard your heart, for out of it, it says your heart is a wellspring of life. Out of it come your most important things. That's where the struggle comes. And if you're between 18 and 35, and that speaker that I heard two weeks ago was correct, sex may be the biggest cult out there. Don't trade your stew for a false promise. Okay, I guess you guys know how this works, right? All right, I, I'm going to start by saying I'm not a skeptic, but I'm going to talk like one for just a minute. <laughs> so you say that, don't say, oh, the, the Bible says, because, well, yeah, because that, that doesn't mean squat for... You could say the Bible says if you're in a theology class. If you're doing apologetics, be a little more circumspect. Okay, so how do you know that the dates 
of the Bible are the same as the days we have now. Like you said, oh, it says here on this wall that the, the mayor of this town was the mayor at these times. Well, how do you know people recorded time back then the same way they do today? So what are you saying? If, if we know that this guy became the mayor of Corinth in 51 to 52, what 51 to 52 would that be? If it's uh, Yeah, like what if? They, they would give the years on their clock and we would simply compare their clock to our clock to get the same year. That's, that's not difficult. All right. <laughs> Pardon? Uh, so that, uh, that's my first question. My second question is how do we know that um, I'm trying to figure out, I'm sure I figured out a way for that to get to you. Anyway, so if Paul, when Paul wrote this stuff down, he was in the prison, right? And you could argue that because he was in the prison that some of the stuff got lost in translation because they didn't really care about it because he was a prisoner. What does he know? So when they were recording it, translating it, everything, or maybe some of it just was thrown out altogether. It's like, oh, who cares about it? I, I think that argument as a whole is very similar to the argument, how do you know if there were some variant that people copied, you know, very early on they copied things incorrectly and everybody who copied from that manuscript copied them incorrectly and said it was Paul, but it wasn't Paul. Okay. And that's why families of New Testament texts are very important. As if you were one of Paul's companions and he scribbled some things down on a sheet of paper and you said, what about this and what about that? And he scribbled a few things and gave it to you. You probably guard that little piece of paper with your life, especially if you died a martyr, you know, a month later. You probably saved that little thing. But the point is, everyone in the meantime is making copies of it and passing it around. So maybe if Paul died a month later, there already may have been 50 copies of it spread around already because people are copying this. So when you have different groups spread around and this family is corrupt because things were put in that Peter, Paul never said, but this group is not corrupt. So you can correct, you can compare what this guy says to what this guy says he said and see who's got historical Paul and who doesn't. You know, Bart Ehrman, someone just sent me this quote the other day that Bart Ehrman says that we know where virtually, we th we've probably found about every variant reading we're gonna find. We know where they are. Virtually every one of them is correctable. He said the ones that are not correctable, and he gave the figure, I already forgot the figure, but the ones that are not correctable are like 0.2, you know, it's a really small number. And then he said, I agree with my mentor the great Bruce Metzger at Princeton. He said he and I believe different things, but I honored him like a father and he was a great man. And he says, I agree with Bruce Metzger that no major theological teaching would be adjusted no matter how much we twist these things around. We have the earliest one and we could either straighten this text out or we can get the same teaching from other texts. That's Ehrman's response to something like that. He says, we know where they are, we can correct them, and we know what the teaching is. I mean, once again, you know, you're putting quivers in your, every time someone tells you that, you're, you're backing, you know, you're having more and more evidence. Thank you for coming. Oh, you're welcome. Um, I just had a, a pretty simple question think I can make it simple. Um, Here, you think, and I'm going to sit. You, you, sit. you better sit down for this one. <laughs> so things like the, the, is it the Upanishads? The what? The, like the Upanishads and the Bhagavad Gita, which would be? Yeah, I said the Bhagavad Gita was plus 4,200. The Upanishads are plus 1,800. Zoroaster is between 1,000 and 1,300 years later. And then the evidence for the resurrection gospel mark. That we can get right back within days or at the most months after the event. Would, 
would you apply the same historical legitimacy um, to the both of those documents? Because I'm just saying, because one's older than the other. Would I apply them to what? Both of what documents? Would they be the same? Like, would across the board, would they say that um, the historical um, context or the historical um, reliability would be the same uh, for something older? What I'm trying to say is. We're, we're, putting their, we're putting the best foot forward for, oh, here's another one for you. If you get a, I heard so many people quote this, that when I found the book in Oxford, um, I bought it. It's now on my shelf. It's called The Buddhist Scriptures. And the author, who has a PhD, and he's a Buddhist, he starts the book this way. He says, let me just, he, this is him talking. He says, let me just say right off the bat, all the sources in this book for Buddha are six to nine hundred years after Buddha died. That's just the best we have. And then he says, we don't have what Christians have. He says, they have the words of their Lord, we don't. We have the words of those who studied under their Lord and those who studied under them, we don't. We got it. They got it from a very early date, we didn't. Everything's late. And he says, so therefore, when Buddhists ask the question, what did Buddha teach? He said, here's the right answer. We don't know because we don't have Buddha's words. They're from 600 to 900 years later. Then he says, we can't even tell you what school of thought he belonged to. He said, I never try to answer this question because all it leads to is infighting. We just don't have the data. Then he gets to the chapter called The Words of Our Lord. And he starts and he goes, I already told you, we don't have the words of our Lord. <laughs> that's, that's the Buddha scholar. It's, it's, uh, it's a hard, Irving Hexham, who teaches at University of Calgary, studied under this guy in England. This guy's Edward Conzi. He's a very well-known Buddha scholar. And uh, he's just saying, we can't, we can't compare. We can't go head to head with the Christians. Thank you. You're welcome. So I think a lot of other people might have the same question. I'm not particularly great at like history or studying scientific evidence and stuff. So how would you suggest an average Joe kind of approach such a complex and like nuanced topic? Okay, now I missed a few words here and there. What's the complex nuanced topic you're talking about? Um, so just like this form of apologetic. So looking at it from a historical document perspective, like if you're defending them as historical documents, if that makes sense. Are you my interpreter? <laughs> I, th I think she's saying with arguments you have premise one, premise two, premise three, mm -hmm. that sort of thing. Everybody can see the same stuff with history. You're reconstructing. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, j I think so. I'm not entirely sure what you said. <laughs> I couldn't hear it as well. Hey, you um, know what? E essentially, this this form of thinking about history and stuff isn't something that I'm very good at, and I'm not very good at researching the reliability of these documents and how logical these arguments are. My brain's not as great at thinking about it that form. So how should I approach this topic? How should you go after this? Mm -hmm. By doing a lot of homework. <laughs> yeah. And then going to talk to your friends. Go to what now? and then go talk to your friends once you have all the arrows put back in your quiver. Hey, I just got an idea for you two guys. You guys should co-author this. A few years ago, when the burial tomb came out, um, did they find Jesus' burial tomb? And they were trying to say they got this ossuary that says, now you gotta read backwards, right? That says, Jesus, the son of Joseph, how did this go? Jesus, the son of the Talpia tomb. Jesus, the son of Joseph, the brother of... It was brother of James. I don't know if it's... Now, now that's the James ossuary. James is Jesus, uh, James, the brother of Jesus, the, the son of Joseph, the brother of Jesus. 
Ben Witherington, by the way, does a whole argument from the resurrection from that ossuary alone. He says, if James was, were buried in the 60s AD and he were still a skeptic, why would he still be claiming Jesus on his bone box? He could only have claimed Jesus if something special had happened to Jesus or the family would have forgotten about him. He would still be a skeptic and he would have no reason to put Jesus on his bone box. It's ingenious. But so anyway, while the Talpia tomb was out, I had an astrophysicist write to me. This guy's got a PhD in astrophysics from Cal Berkeley. And he, was, he made a sliding scale for people that you can put your own figures in. And he sent it to me, and it was brilliant. And you put your figures in. He goes, here's the 10 most important questions. What's the likelihood of this? What's the likelihood of this? What's the likelihood of this? You put it together, it jumbles the numbers, and it says, you have a 14% chance that this is Jesus' burial grave. And you go, I, I quit. That's ridiculous. Ridiculously low. All right. You guys should put together a list of arrows in the quiver, and what's the kalam, what's the moral argument, what's t uh, ID, what's this, what's that, what's resurrection, what's near-death experiences, what's this and that, and let everybody put their own percentage on it, and then go to the end and say, how likely is Christianity based on these evidences? I think this would be a bestseller. I get a piece of the action. <laughs> No, but if I showed you, this guy's a novelist. This guy quit astrophysics, and he writes best-selling novels right now. He's a committed Christian. But I have it on my computer. I have this thing he did. And all you do is pop the numbers in and slide it over, and it gives you your readout. That would be cool to do Christianity that way. And let everybody, and you go, well, you're a skeptic. Come in, come on, cut all yours in half and see what you come up with. I think they'd be surprised how many arguments there are for Christianity. Oh, and then by the way, you have to put their philosophy on the scale and give the percentages for theirs. 14, 6, 2, that would be their philosophies.